So, uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2, when the things of God have to be spiritually appraised, the natural man does not accept the things of God, okay? Now, the spiritual man, as opposed to the natural man, is that God, the Holy Spirit, indwelling us, or is that the living human spirit of a believer? Because if it requires God, the Holy Spirit, indwelling us to study the Word of God, then all the Old Testament saints were stuck out, or most of them. How do they learn doctrine? But if it's the living human spirit of a regenerate man born again in Christ, or born again, okay, Old Testament wasn't in Christ, but if they're born again and they have a living human spirit, they become trichotomous in their saved state, then with a living human spirit, they have the capacity to comprehend spiritual truth. And the Holy Spirit can guide them in the truth. See, I don't think the guiding into the truth, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, I don't think is, is tied to the indwelling. Holy Spirit guided Old Testament saints into the truth as well. All right, so good question on that. Other questions? All right, section two then. Or um, chapter two. The deity of the Holy Spirit. Again, this is a review because it was covered in theology proper. It was covered in volume one. And so we understand that the Father is God, always has been. Jesus Christ is God, always has been. The Holy Spirit is God, always has been. Um, is there a verse you, you can take a, a baby believer to and just show them right there in a simple fashion, like with Great Commission or, or with uh, baptism? I think there is. I think it's Acts chapter 5. If you look with me in Acts chapter 5, you will see very quickly in back-to-back -back verses, lying to the Holy Spirit and lying to God. And so uh, verse 3 and verse 4 of Acts chapter 5. And you can take somebody right here, if they were just saved this morning, and say, look at that. Okay. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Keep in mind, this is going to come up in, in our angelic conflict doctrines very quickly pending here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Satan, we cannot be possessed, but can we be influenced? Can Satan whisper? Can we pay attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons? Can we listen to them? Can he fill our hearts? Well, if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, there's a vacuum there that's waiting to be filled with something. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then verse 4 says, you have not lied to men, but to God. So I like this. This is, to me, this is one of my favorite places. I've gone here for years and years. Because you can just point right there. There's lying to the Holy Spirit. There's lying to God. The Holy Spirit is God. Okay? And to me, that's pretty straightforward. But there's other reasons to believe that the Holy Spirit is God. And this chapter takes you through all of them. Well, he's eternal. We saw that already, right? If he's eternal, he's got to be God. Uh, he has all these divine attributes. You know, the eternal spirit, Hebrews 9.14. Omnipotence. Um, 1 Peter 3.18. And in some of these, if we think they're shaky, we ought to come up with better verses, shouldn't we? Okay. Um, it says, Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, or by the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Okay, I, uh, I don't think that's the Holy Spirit there. I think it's a contrast between flesh and spirit with respect to his human body, with respect to his human spirit. So I would want to look somewhere else from the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.32 and Galatians 1.1 1, 1 are the references to the resurrection of Christ by the power of the Father, by the power of Christ, and so forth. So... With point two, omnipotence, do you doubt that the Holy Spirit is omnipotent? I don't doubt that the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, but I want a better verse than 1 Peter 3.18, because I think that's actually debatable. Okay? I might go to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit brooding over the surface of the deep. I might go to other things that the Spirit does that shows his omnipotence, that shows his power. All right. Like strengthen with all power through his Spirit in the inner man. What else has all power but the omnipotent God? Okay, so use that instead. Omnipresence. This one is a good reference. 
Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Can you flee from God the Holy Spirit? How many times have you tried? Okay, too many to count. All right, this is not confession night, so we won't ask for a show of hands. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, just as the Father is omnipresent, just as God the Son is omnipresent. Uh, the fact that he's omnipresent proves that he's God. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. You know, wherever Jonah ran, God was right there. Wherever we run, God's right there. Okay. Omniscience. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. So he draws an analogy between the human spirit in our existence and God the Holy Spirit in the Trinity, in the Godhead. And uh, sure, he knows all things. I don't think we can debate that. And, uh, yeah, love, the fruit of the Spirit is love, Galatians 5.22. God is love, the fruit of the Spirit is love, the Holy Spirit produces love, God's kind of love. So we can see that he's the, the nature of the Holy Spirit's essence is compatible with the nature of God's essence. Faithfulness, again, the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness, Galatians 5.22. If faithfulness is, a, is an attribute of God, we see it there applied to the Holy Spirit. Truthfulness, God is true, in him there is no lie, and we understand the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of Truth. Holiness. You know, who's holy besides God? Well, the Holy Spirit is called holy. Okay, so again, we find that he shares every one of these attributes of God is assigned to the Holy Spirit. Put them all together, I think it's pretty undeniable that uh, God is... Uh, that the Holy Spirit is full deity, that the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, did you, would you pick up on Isaiah 6 when the angels are singing holy, holy, holy? Yeah. Did you pick up on that? I've never often taught it that way, but then again, I haven't taught Isaiah verse by verse. But uh, is that a reference to Trinity? Are the angels singing to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Holy, holy, holy? Could be. Okay. Seems to agree with uh, also the... Uh, uh, the benediction from Deuteronomy. Okay, another trin Trinitarian passage there. Um, yeah, why, why not two holies? Why not one holy? Why, why not four holies? Why is it exactly three? Why does Jesus on the cross say, my God, my God? Is he talking to the Father and the Holy Spirit? Okay, a lot of, a lot of people think so. So we got these, these um, different expressions. Okay, beyond what he is, there's also what he does. And if he does things that only God can do, then what does that tell you? He's God, okay? We use similar, uh, by the way, similar logic and study uh, with respect to God the Son, to Jesus Christ, to prove that he's God. Because he's eternal. Because he's omnipotent, all right? Because he uh, forgives sin, for example. Well, who's entitled to do that besides God? And so many of the same processes in their nature and in their work, we see um, if only God can do it and the Holy Spirit's doing it, Okay. Like the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. The work of the Holy Spirit in creation. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. I think this applies to both God the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, you have a question on this? Yeah, bottom of page 25. Bottom of page 25. It talks about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but he never really brought it some people teach that it's in that time that only applies. Some people teach that it applies when the believer does not accept Christ. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he was approaching in that. You're right. He mentions it, but then he doesn't fully spell it out, does he? Um, let me chew on that, because that, that, that may come up later in this volume. I don't remember. Yeah, let's come back to that. If it doesn't come back later in the volume, then we'll, we'll address that. Because we taught that actually in the Life of Christ series. So if it doesn't come up in this volume, then I can send you some information from that. Other questions? Related to his being? We can move on to his work? Okay. 
Uh, the Holy Spirit's involved in creation. We already talked about Genesis, how he's brooding over the surface of the deep. But even beyond Genesis, we've got Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. And so we understand that God the Son is the primary agent of, of creation. The Father designed the universe as the architect, but the Son constructed it as the wise master builder, all right, as the chief uh, builder. Um, but what was the role of the Holy Spirit in this? Well, we understand in the provision of breath, of course, Adam, uh, God breathed into Adam and received the breath of life. And, and uh, here we're told, by the breath of his mouth, all their host. And since the word breath is the word for spirit, we, we can identify with that. We can say, okay, there was a role here pertaining to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Psalm 104. You send forth your spirit, they are created. You renew the face of the ground. So there's a reference there to God's Spirit. Actually, the verse before that, you take away their spirit and uh, they expire. They return to the dust. But you send forth your spirit, they are created. You renew the face of the ground. Neat doctrine there in Psalm 104. Uh, he also talks about Job, right? There's Ezekiel, there's Job. By his breath, the heavens are cleared. His hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. Behold, these are the fringes of his ways. How, and how faint a word we hear of him, but his mighty thunder, who can understand? I think the patriarchs understood a whole lot more about the angelic realm than we give them credit for. It's because he certainly knows who the fleeing serpent is here. All right, of course, Genesis 1, 2. Not sure how that opened up. Genesis 1, 2. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering, brooding, uh, moving over the surface of the waters. And there's no shortage of journal articles discussing the nature of that verb of what the uh, Spirit of God is doing over the surface of the waters. But clearly, the Father has a role, the Son has a role, the Holy Spirit has a role in the creative activity. The mouse is doing weird things. Okay. Um, creating, striving. Genesis 6, 3. My spirit shall not always strive with man. All right? The striving work of the Holy Spirit. The inspiring work of the Holy Spirit. There's a third section. I enjoyed uh, last hour, by the way, the fact that our scriptures are 100% human and 100% divine. That's true. This text uh, describes that. And the role of the Holy Spirit here in inspiration. I think I colored something yellow here in this section. Yes. Theopneusti. Uh, that inexplicable power which the divine spirit formerly exercised over the authors of the Holy Scriptures to guide them even in the employment of the words they were to use and to preserve them from all error as well as from every omission. I enjoyed that as a description of the the Pneustos activity of the inspiration of Scripture. No more does the human element in the written word jeopardize the infinite excellency of the divine element therein than does the humanity of Christ, the living word, jeopardize the deity which he is. Okay? And similar to what we heard last hour, the, the, the nature of the Bible as both God, the work of God and man is similar to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. Fully God, fully man. Okay? True humanity and undiminished deity united together in one person forever. Likewise, the scriptures, written with hum by human agents, written by human agents with human hands on you know, physical scrolls, but inspired by God and carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that unity of uh, divine and human in, pr in producing the perfect, inspired word of God, just like the perfection of the person of Christ. I enjoyed that section there very much. 